Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 43. All right, this is going to be the first episode of the new year, 2021. We made it through 2020. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. No, uh, looking forward to this next year, bringing more, more videos to y'all. Please leave comments uh, down below or uh, send us email at tidy.explained at gmail.com to let us know what content you'd like to see over this next year. Uh, because we want to make sure that we're giving you what what you're excited to learn about. I mean, we're just having a great time putting this together for y'all. Yeah, hopefully, I guess we can be optimistic that hopefully in 2021 we will get to do some uh, uh, some shows in person. Yes, uh, so, I don't, I don't yeah. know if anyone's noticed this, but we have not been in the same place for any of these episodes. Uh, well, episode one. Episode one. Yes, we that's did. True. Yeah, but yeah, we didn't have absolutely. video for that one. <laughs> Oh, that's right. So no one would have known that we were in the same place. That's right. Exactly. But anyway, getting back to what we were talking about, this is TidyX episode 43. TidyX is a screencast where we go through and explain how our code works. My name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can find the screencast on Twitter at, at Tidy underscore explained. Uh, and there let's, we go. Uh, let's jump in. What I guess... We do have kind of a the a, a cool tweet that was a recap of uh, there. There's a lot if you actually if you search the tweets um, this week. There's lots of people who did their kind of Tidy Tuesday 2020 recap of some of their favorite figures and, and plots and visualizations that they built. So it's kind of a nice way to just look back and see and maybe get some ideas for the future. Um, but mm -hmm. we we like. We thought this yeah. one was kind of cool. Yeah, I'm sharing it right now, Patrick. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen so that you can see as well. Okay, yeah. Uh, let me uh, share the screen here. Badoom. And this was share. Gustav. Gustav. Yeah. Gustav. So this was really cool. I thought Gustav. it was, uh, he did, I looked at his code. His code is shared in the comments here. Um, we're not going to go through this, but we just wanted to call this out as a great um, example of uh, data viz and kind of summing up 2020 for us so yeah I that's mean, pretty cool you're, you're pretty excited to see us in there as well so. yeah i wonder if it, it, well not only tidy x i think he yeah there we, there are some of our our mugs there yeah that so just wanted to give a quick shout out for that one <laughs> yeah um, that's awesome yeah and then we're going to continue on there was no tidy tuesday data this week yep. um to be clear there in theory will be some in 2020 uh, ah. Hopefully, we hope. We hope. We, yeah. Um, but we're going to continue our study of Plotly and of hockey, and we're doing yeah. this with funnel plots this week. Yeah. Yeah. So Patrick uh, very kindly put this code together. The beginning chunk is going to be fairly familiar because it is the exact same data that we used last week. So we'll kind of zoom that, zoom through that, and then we'll get into talking more about uh, exploring this data some more. All right, so the first couple lines, loading Tidyverse, Plotly, and Arvest. These are the libraries that we need for data manipulation, the uh, interactive data viz, and then Arvest to pull in the data for us from the uh, Hockey Reference website. Then we're going to go and pull in the data using this URL here. We're going to read. Uh, so we, this is the website that has the data on it. We're going to read that HTML uh, and ripping that down for us. Then we're going to pull out the table that exists. So hockey, hockey HTML, pull out the table node, convert it into a data frame using HTML table. And then we're going to set the column names to be one through however many column names that exist. And we're going to call that hockey table. Next, we're going to go through and we know the fields that we want to be pulling out are columns 2, 5, 6, 7, and 20. So we're going to pull those in. We're going to rename them to be the, the what we actually know the names to be. So player, position, games, goals, and shots. We're gonna filter out to keep any rows where the uh, column player has the value player because on the website it repeats um, yeah. the headers. Uh, so that's how we remove that. We're gonna group by player and try to summarize because a player could be listed multiple times if they played for multiple teams. So we will summarize across those and summarize the games through shots so that would be those values there. So games, goals, and shots. And With that, just to be clear on the, the scraping there, on the select, the reason why um, I set it to the numbers of columns is because uh, the hockey reference, as all the reference websites, have like this double row header. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So it it might be like shooting and then it's all your shooting stats and then assists and all your assist stats under that. So there, because of that, when R reads in the table, it thinks of only that top row as the, um, uh, as the header header for the, uh, for the data frame. Um, So many of them are not named because it's, you know, one header shooting across maybe like five or six rows. Uh, so that's what the, you know normally i would specify the exact row that i wanted and not leave it up to chance that i'm numerically selecting because if data changes and all of a sudden let's say number 20 is no longer you know the number of shots that the player takes but it's it's something else mm-hmm. um and if, if it, you know then you're in, then you're in real trouble especially if you're automating the data yeah. scraping so yeah. <laughs> So that is a, a, a word of warning about don't just use uh, numbers yeah. to select your column names. Uh, we're doing this because we have to. Uh, yeah. Try to use the column names when you can, which is why we assign the column names here so that we can use that going forward. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to keep the position to be the uh, whichever position they play the most games as. This, this doesn't really change. Uh, I, we couldn't find a definition for what position was on hockey references website Uh, so we're assuming it's the most commonly played position that they had Um, and then we're going to summarize positions to be the actual position that they played and then the number of games goals and shots they had at that position and we're going to use the dot groups equals drops because we don't want to keep the uh, grouping anymore and we're also then going to calculate a shooting percentage for each player, which is the number of goals they made divided by number of shots they made. And that's how you get this mutate here. So let's run all this. And so now we've got a data set that we're gonna be using going forward where we have player, games, goals, shots, position, positions with informa- position with information around the number of games they played, goals they shot, or goals they made and shots they had, and the final shooting percentage at the end of the season. And this is for 2020. So now we're gonna go through and start exploring the data. Pat, you wanna take us through this? Yeah, so um, one of the things, you know, when you're looking at players and things like shooting percentage or in basketball field percentage or batting average, if you're talking about baseball or on-base percentage or something like that, um, obviously comparing players to each other is the, you know, that's like the pinnacle of sport, right? How did this guy do relative to the other guys? And that's what we're going to do here today using some funnel plots and using some plots of of the players' values and their confidence intervals. And in order to make a comparison, we don't want to just compare the players to each other. We also want to compare them to some sort of benchmark. Um, So in order to identify that benchmark, I wanted to get an idea for the distribution of shots that we observe within the data set as some function of telling us, well, on average, players are shooting about this much. And once they achieve this many shots, this is the general shooting percentage, uh, uh, shot uh, goal percentage uh, of that player. And so uh, of those players, of that population. So in order to get that benchmark, the first thing is like, what's what's a sample size? What are the sample size? So looking at the quantiles of uh, number of shots taken, we can see it's a pretty broad range. We have some people who never take a shot and we have at least someone at the hundred percent at the max level who take a whole boatload of shots. Uh, Generally the interquartile range. So between the 25th and 75th percentile right there is between 22 and 128 shots. So that's pretty broad range, which we kind of expect because we have lots of different position groups and some position groups shoot and others don't. We've obviously omitted goalies from this analysis who would probably you know, never have shots, yeah. right? We also didn't filter to remove any players that had played less than any N number of games or something like that, which we did last week. This right. is literally all the players. Yes, and the, you'll see the reason why uh, coming up here when we look at the data. Uh, so we can look at this by uh, uh, the quantile by uh, uh, position group. So I use the little by function here from base R and I say, okay, I want to look at shots as a function of position group, and I want to do that by quantiles. And so um, that gives us kind of the quantiles. So we see centers and uh, defensemen are kind of similar-ish shooters at the bottom. And then you can see there's a bunch of centers who shoot a whole bunch more than the defensemen. The forwards, uh, 
this was kind of weird to me. I thought forwards, I think of like soccer forwards are like your shooters. So I was like, oh, that's weird. Maybe again, I don't know a ton about hockey. I'm trying to learn more. So as we, as we're we figuring it out, get the yeah. crack in. By, so. by the way, thank you, um, one of our viewers, for leaving comments on the last video kind of explaining a little bit about hockey because that was really helpful for us to get a yeah. little bit better understanding of what was going on with that. Yeah, exactly. We're, 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 um, We've been sort of side ice fans, but now we're ready with a team coming to town. We're ready to jump. We get to jump in. Um, the left wing and the right wing shooters. So this was a cool one that we kind of quickly investigated at the start was why are the left wing shooters just absurdly more than everybody else? Even at the low end, at the at the lowest, you know, at the 25th percentile, um, I mean, it's significant they're higher. still, you know, they're like over double. <laughs> And it's because the guys playing left wing are right-handed shooters. There's more right-handed um, stick handlers in the league, right? And so in the I world. guess <laughs> in, the, in the world, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So ah, kind of interesting. Um, yeah. And then the W is, is wing. I, I'm guessing that's because hockey reference had, you know, they couldn't figure out a way. Maybe it's like, these are your ambidextrous uh, shooters. They really? can play on the other side. I don't know. They have they have a stick for the right side and a stick for the left side. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah. that that that's that's kind of a, a look at the quantiles. And then, of course, we can visualize this as as kind of our uh, step in exploratory data analysis. So we take our NHL data. Uh, we're going to use ggplot for this. We're going to take the shots and fill it by position, so they kind of pop out. And we're going to use a density plot, which is going to give us the density of the data. We're going to set some facets to be position group and then um, just throw a title on it and, uh, and get rid of the legend because we've filled by position group. The legend doesn't really help us explain any more information. It just becomes chart junk at that point. Mm -hmm. And then we see our nice um, distributions here. Uh, we can also plot these distributions by bo uh, box plot in some sort of kind of uh, rank order -ing. Mm -hmm. so we so, can right there. So we're going to take the, literally the exact same type of data, just changing it to box plot. Um, the only thing I did there at the Y axis was reorder the positions by the number of shots so that it came out in this cool kind of uh, ordering where we see the left uh, wingers are shooting more than, uh, more than everybody else essentially. Exactly. So and then we use GM box plot to make the box plots. Yep. Same GG title and, and theme here. But yeah. So I mean, but there's not a lot of information you can get out of this. I mean, well, there, so there is. Like yeah. you can see, left wingers on average are shooting more than everybody else. Uh, yeah. But like you can't get any information. I mean, you see some outliers here where you know the center of this this you, person you, here shot a yeah. lot, but you you no idea that you can't see. Okay, what about a player that's shooting just above average? How do they, how do they compare? And and then like, how many shots are they making versus how many shots are taking and stuff like that? You, this is yeah. very flat. Yeah, it's literally just this is just sample size information. It's not telling us about the success of the players. Um, the only purpose of doing this was to then allow us to establish some sort of benchmark. So. Um, which is what I throw in here, which is the league average shooting percentage. So we use a mutate. I, uh, I'm i going to treat all of the shooters across position groups as a single population here. And I'm going to basically say I want the median value of the shooting percentage of all of the league. Remember, we haven't filtered anyone out of all of the league, but I only want the median shooting percentage of those players who took more than the average number of shots. So these are the this is the shooting percentage of the average shooters by sample size, and this is what's um, uh, going to give us our benchmark shooting percentage to basically compare all the players to. And again, this is this is establishing this as treating everybody like one single population. If we wanted to do this within position group, really easily we could slap a group by in there um, after the NHL. Uh, uh, after the NHL pipe in, in the uh, tidyverse code there. Yep, we could do group by position, and this would basically give us the league average median shooting percentage 
at each position group for shooters who took over the average, right? We could do, easily do something like that. So we could throw that in every one or two. It, exactly. Or two. But we're just going to treat them all as one uh, population for the purposes of uh, showing how this will work. Simplicity. Exactly. So we'll move on to just a, a simple plot of the point estimate of the players and then the confidence intervals, which represent the certainty that we're going to have around this player's shooting percentage. And we're going to do this at the 95% confidence interval and the 99% confidence interval. So that kind of comes from a normal distribution. So we're going to actually calculate these out. Do you want to walk through this part and then I'll go through funnel plots? Sure thing. All right. So we're going to take that NHL data set there. We're going to throw it into a mutate. We're going to calculate the confidence level at 95%, which is going to be two times. This is the uh, standard deviation, kind of. Correct. Yeah. So two times the standard deviation for, uh, this is going to be for each player. Um, the standard yes. Uh, so two times the standard deviation is 95%. Three times the standard deviation is 99%. Yeah. Yay, my stats and all that. And we're doing that. Um, the reason why this is for every player and we don't have to do the group uh, a group by player is because every player is one row within this data set. They're already aggregated at the season level. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we don't have to do that. We're going to randomly subset to keep 15 players uh, just to keep this fresh and new every time we look at it. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, uh, we'll have 500-some uh, players. In yeah, them. exactly. So we want to subset it to make it simpler just to be able to explain this concept. Uh, we're going to then throw it into a GG plot. Uh, the X axis, uh, we're going to use aesthetic. X axis is going to be shooting percentage. Y axis is going to be reordering the players, the 15 players that we had by their shooting percentage. Then we're going to add a geom V line. So this is going to be a vertical line where the X intercept, so that where it is on the X axis, is going to be the league average shooting percentage, which is just under 10%. Uh, percent. We're going to color it red going to be a dashed line and we're going to make it ever so slightly wider at uh, size 1.1 um, then we're going to add a geo point and so this is going to be now for each player uh, we're going to add in a point which is the point estimate of their average or of their shooting percentage and we're going to make the size of that dot the based on the number of shots they've made so if they've made more shots the dot is going to be larger if they made less shots the dot is going to be smaller just to give us a little bit of context when we're looking at it and then we're going to add some error bars around it which is why we used these confidence uh that we calculated confidence levels so we're going to calculate the uh use geom error bar uh, we need to specify where it needs to start and end and this is going to be with x min and x max um, the minimum level is going to be um, 99 or the shooting percentage that they shot subtract into, uh, the 99% confidence level and the max is going to be adding 99% confidence level so it's going to kind of draw a bar across that of where we're confident that it how far they're going to be shooting same idea here with the 95% confidence interval but this time we're going to make the line a little bit thicker so we can see the difference between the 99 and the 95% confidence levels then I'm going to we're going to add in the scale x continuous because everything has been calculated to percents but we haven't converted them to a percent that you know we immediately recognize as like 10% it's going to be like 0.1 so we're going to add this label scales percent to scale x, y continuous to make it so it's just a little bit easier for us to immediately understand what's going on. So we're gonna plot that and give my computer a second. There we go. All right. So oh, this, oh, is, this a is perfect. perfect. Example. This is wonderful. All right. What so, a sample. <laughs> yes. Thank you, random gods. Uh, so as you can see here, here's a vertical line where it was red. It's dashed. This is the league average shooting. Um, and then these are the scales converted to percents. So and, and realistically, we could truncate at zero. You know, you wouldn't have a negative. Nobody's negative twenty percent shooter. So he's actually <laughs> scoring goals for against his the other own team. team. He's going the other way. Um, in reality, is... we would hack it at zero. And, and yeah. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, so this is now each player's on the y-axis. We can see the confidence uh, intervals for each player. Um, and this is just perfect because Andrew Ladd has had very few shots. His dot is incredibly small. But when you look at this, you might think, well, Andrew Ladd's better than Eric Halla. Like, without any context, yeah, you might think or, Andrew's better. Or Nicholas Roy is better than... Uh, 
Ricard Raquel, Raquel or Johnny Gaudreau. It, it, it's when you build a visualization, um, you're telling a story. And for the viewer of the visualization, especially if it's maybe like a non-technical audience, I mean, even for myself, it's sometimes hard to get away from the rank order of the presentation of a figure like this. And so even though we can see someone like Nicholas Roy is better than league average, he has a very small, I mean, that's what, you know, this plot is showing a lot of information where we're actually showing the sample size in, in the size of the dot. Um, even though we can see that he's better than league average, he hasn't shot very much. He hasn't even shot over six, uh, 50 times. Mm -hmm. And so his uncertainty is rather large, but it's hard for sometimes our head to, to wrap our head around rather the fact that he on this chart is better than Johnny Godreau, who we're pretty certain is an average league shooter. I mean, the guy's shot, that's probably like 200 or more 250 times. 50 times is roughly kind of the size that it looks to be. I, exactly. He's very so, close to league average, though. So exactly. we're pretty and, confident he's at least average. Yeah, we're, we're more confident in his ability, right? Because we've seen more of it. Um, so it's hard for people to look at a plot sometimes like this and, and wrap their head around um, anything other than the rank order that you're showing them. And if we had not done the shot sizes by, uh, or sorry, change the dot by shot size, this would have even looked more interesting because they would have looked all pretty much the same with the exception of the error bars, which for a non-technical person uh, might really be challenging yeah. to. Uh, so just so that we can show that, I'm just going to delete that. Yeah. And we'll get a new subsample of people, obviously, but. Yeah, but um, you, know, you probably want to set the size just to be like a generic, like four, you know, something. Uh, C's size. C's. 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 Uh, yeah, five. Right That'll be probably good. There you go. Oh, that's that's massive. That's like a but, massive bug. But it'll, yeah, it'll, no, that's perfect. Yeah. But I mean, it, you know, we're, we're, we, we tried to capture the information about more than just the uncertainty bars. We tried to capture. Yeah information of uncertainty in a couple different ways to try to push that that uh, narrative that this is where they're at right now right. but we don't have all the knowledge necessarily to be and able to call it this without the size of those uh, uh points changing i mean this is even really hard to read like i could like teasing apart differences in those players is you know now really challenging yeah i mean you might be able to say that Corey Perry versus Gabriel, uh, Jean Gabriel. Like, yeah. You might be able to make that conclusion. I mean, yeah. there's very little overlap in their confidence. Or there's no overlap in their 95% confidence intervals. It looks right, like. right, right. So right. you could say like in a T-test. No, I don't, don't want to betray compare, my, Comparing my two, two distributions, sure. Yeah. You could compare two distributions like that. Yeah, but... Um. And there's other ways. I mean, we could build simulations of the players, all these things. But in general, it's it's difficult to read uh, sometimes for the viewer. And so one of the things that um, uh, people have, have started to do is plot data like this in what's called a funnel plot. Uh, and sometimes you'll see this in like a meta analysis, which is, is basically a way that researchers take um, uh, they take a whole bunch of studies that are believed to be similar in some way, basically like similar populations, answering similar questions, things like that. And they combine those studies, they combine the data from those studies in order to, to try and make a more succinct statement mm -hmm. about a body of work, about a body of knowledge. Um, and obviously those studies are, you know, they have different sizes of effects that have been observed. They have different sample sizes. So you have to weight things based on, you know, the sample size of each of the study and all of that information. And what sometimes they'll plot things in this way as a funnel plot, which shows the, represents the data um, based on the sample size. And, and actually in some research, like in medical research, they find that providing even non-technical uh, you know, participants, like people who are just off the street, showing them um, success rates of surgical centers that have different sample sizes of surgeries performed and saying, which would you like to go to? When they show them that rank order, they can't get away from the rank order. So even if there's one with really large error bars, but it looks to be better, they might still say like, well, that, one, that one's better. It's on the top. 
Mm. Whereas when they show them the funnel plot, they tend to make better decisions because it represents the entire range of possible distributions. And so that's what we calculate here. So we're going to calculate this, uh, create this new data frame called NFL funnel. NHL. And all we're basically doing is taking the NHL data and we're adding the confidence intervals, intervals for the population across the entire range of shots, everywhere from zero to whatever it was for that left winger, 465, I think was the max number of shots. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's the same calculations as above. We're just doing this um, across, we're gonna do this across the entire population as a function of plotting it. So we calculate the confidence intervals. Uh, I do a little thing there at the top where basically if there was any NAs, um, I use the coalesce function to say, hey, if you find an NA in the shooting percent column, just drop a zero in there. So I just zero everything out. We calculate the confidence interval, same as we did before. And then we arrange everything by the number of shots. So we're going from high to low. And then we're going to plot these, uh, these funnel, this funnel plot. So it's an NHL funnel plot. We're going to take the NHL funnel data. We're going to pass the GG plot with uh, shots on the x-axis and y-axis is going to be the shooting percentage. The, we're going to put points in for that shooting percentage. And then we're going to draw a horizontal line at the league average. And then we're going to draw our funnel plots, and you'll see why it's called a funnel plot here, using these geom lines, each line representing the high and low 95 and 99% confidence intervals, respectively. And we make them colored, so 95 is going to be blue, and 99 is going to be red. And just some simple labels, we shots and shooting percentage, and then the scale is continuous again to put everything on that percentage scale. And this is why it's called a funnel plot, because the funnel starts very wide at the top. When we have a very small sample size, uncertainty is greater. And as we move from left to right across the plot, our, un our certainty becomes much more uh, much greater as we see more shots of that individual. And if you remember, um, we did something similar to this, where we actually constrained win percentage in volleyball athletes back in episode 11. 11, yeah. We used a, Bayes, a Bayesian approach to constrain win percentage based on prior knowledge of win percentage for uh, professional vo beach volleyball players. Um, so this is sort of a similar type of approach. We're not constraining any of the data here, though. All we're doing is representing it relative to our certainty at every given number of shots, every given number of sample size. And so this plot is interesting to look at, but we can obviously make it more useful by adding the dimension of who the people are, because yeah. we might want to scroll over this and say, well, who is that guy, right? Yeah, who is that guy that's right? outside the three standard deviation mark at a, a, just over 300 shot attempts? That's impressive. Yeah. So we're going to use Plotly for that, which we used last week. And so we're going to extend some of our Plotly work. So we're taking the, the funnel plot, um, we do a little mutate here. This is just to get the actual low and high values because I want to be able to dump those in as specific lines within Plotly. We call the Plotly function, which is going to help us build our base Plotly uh, plot. And we are going to add trace. So we're adding the markers, which is going to be the dots with the x-axis, same thing, shots and shooting percentage on the y. And we create our nice little hover template that we did last week so that we get a very specific tool tip as we scroll over the person so we can see players, positions, shots, goals, and shooting percentage. And now we add our lines. We're going to add a line for the, um, uh, the shots at the confidence interval of low. It's going to be blue. We're going to add a shot uh, confidence interval of high for 95. It's going to also be blue. So we're adding those is, as um and passing those as a list within the line argument. So we want it to be a, a, the dash to be dotted and we want the color to be blue. We do the same for the 99% confidence intervals at low and high. This time we just change the color to red. And then we want to add one single line that represents the least shooting average. And it's going to be just a thick black line that's going horizontal across the screen. And we're just going to get rid of the legend because we don't need it. There's, there's no extra information in the... In the um, it does, it's lesson. not adding anything. It's just chart junk. Yes. And so now we have the exact same plot with the benefit of being able to scroll over players or to zoom in on a population. So we can hover and zoom in and get all the players. And this actually 
shows you um, guys, you know, now you can see guys that are over the 95% confidence interval. You can see guys that are over the 92% or 99% confidence interval. Those would be kind of unique, um, unique players that maybe are, we would think are better than average, right? They're mm -hmm. actually, you know, we have enough sample size maybe there to say like, wow, this guy's actually a pretty valuable shooter to his team. Yeah, exactly. So then and, we can go out and then we can see the Jean Gabriel. Well, there he is. So he's really darn good. <laughs> at least we're assuming so based on our limited knowledge and the stats that we're looking at right now. Correct. Correct. Where yeah. he's, he's uh, above the 99 percentile. Yeah. Three standard deviations away from the mean. Yeah. And then maybe out here, Taylor Hall is taking a lot of shots. And he's below average. He, so stop shooting. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe pick your shots. I don't know. Maybe he's the only shooter on their team. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. I think he does. But, <laughs> but yeah, so this is a way to add a little bit of more information around what you're looking at yeah. without just looking at the confidence uh, intervals because that can be a little bit difficult to, to really grasp. You're able to look at this and like really understand. Yeah, provides extra context. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. like back here where this person, Morgan Geeky, yeah, shooting at seventy five percent. Wow, that's amazing. That's that's so much more. But but they've shot four times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, so we're not certain about that person. Yeah, we we're less confident in yes, their, in, in because they're pushed over to the left side. You you're kind of probably not going to look at them as uh, in the superstar. Spot, yeah, right? exactly. As, with as much confidence as you would maybe Dominic. Exactly. Here. That's shot now 150 times, made 30 times, averaging roughly 19%. Yeah. 10% above the average, yeah. And that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So that, that'd be a good way to add extra context. Yeah. So, yeah. And so that's that's a way that you can create a funnel plot with Plotly. There you go. Funnel plots with Plotly. There you go. All right. And I think with that, we're going to end it a little bit yep. early so that everyone can get back to enjoying their new year. Football. College football. <laughs> College football and NFL, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> and we'll do that. But all right, so we're going to call it. Uh, thank you all for watching. If you have anything you'd like us to cover, leave a comment down below or send us an email at tidy.explained at gmail.com or drop us a line on Twitter at tidy underscore explained. Uh, or you can tag either Patrick and I. My I'm on Twitter at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. All right. I think we're going we're gonna to end it now, I guess. <laughs> I've said Happy New Year. Times. Happy New Year. <laughs> Keep on exploring your world. Mm -hmm.